I'm going to meander just a little bit. The way you get into a pool, which is what a conversation is. Um, so I made some notes a few, an hour and a half ago about this. Uh, Marika and I have been dancing around trying to find some common ground. And uh, I'll explain why we didn't and how not finding common ground was a very profound form of common ground. So I wrote here a couple of notes. I say it's the nature, it's the nature of conversation that it has neither a beginning nor an end, but is actually always a kind of a filling in of a middle. I've known Marika, for example, I thought since 2003, but it turns out it's maybe 10 years ago uh, uh, at Harvard. It was uh, in the context of a course. I don't know what, it, what the course was on, actually. I don't remember it, but what I do remember, and I really mean this, it's not just a, a conceit for, the, uh, for this particular occasion, is that it was a very intense conversation, and it was particularly Marika uh, with whom that conversation in that classroom uh, was taking place. It had to do at that time with a whole bunch of stuff which Marika knew better than I did, um, and that was to do with things like uh, the movements in aesthetics in the 1990s, relational aesthetics, um, agonistic, uh, uh, whatever it is, agonistic forms of... Uh, uh, agonistic democracy. Agonistic democracy, agonistic yeah, agoras, uh, participation, etc. So it, I have to say that particular course, and of course I don't remember what it was, but I remember its form. It was a game changer for me because it changed the way I taught pretty much thereafter. Now I know if any of my students are in the room today, they're going to say, no, that's not what you're doing, Quinter. But the truth of the matter is, I know I'm lecturing like a fool right now, because it's basically because I have limited amount of time and a, f a sense of anxious urgency about how much there needs to be downloaded in order to begin to change the general ecology that will make it possible to have some conversations of a certain kind again. But having said that, um, it was a game changer for me because I began to consider how knowledge is produced, how it's circulated, how it's exchanged, in the context of an older idea, which I picked up actually as a, as a high school student from Gregory Bateson. And in Bateson's wonderful book, written sometime in the mid-1960s or possibly early 1960s, it was called Steps to an Ecology of Mind. He posits the idea of a metalogue, which is really just a dialogue with the word meta, in a way, added onto it to produce an extra dimension. Um, and what is uh, the metalogue? Well, the metalogue basically is a dialogue about a topic, but it is meant also to embody and to address the actual exchange to the conversation and the form of the conversation itself. And I thought to myself, well, how the hell does he do that? I was a student of literary, you know, literary theory and studied literary form, et cetera, and everybody was experimenting with literary form virtually throughout the 20th century. And I thought, well, exactly how is that happening here in his metalogues? Um, and when I went back and looked at them, I realized that it was something fascinating going on, and it was that uh, he would have these conversations with his young daughter, for those of you who know them, and, and they began when she was eight years old. She says, and what I noticed is that the eight-year-old was the one who was bringing the insights to the table, and it was his role, and he must have been 50 or 60 at the time, uh, he would basically unfold them. And I realized there's the interesting thing in a conversation, and that's the interesting thing, the most interesting thing I would say these days that can happen uh, in, in a classroom. The most famous concept, the most famous conversation that they had was based around the following idea. She says to him at the age of eight, she says, Daddy, why do things so often get in a muddle? Of course, it's a great topic for Bateson. In fact, I'm pretty sure she never said that. He just told her to say that, or he made it up. But of course, the question is, is the muddle versus tidiness? Of course, it allowed him to bring up the idea you know, to bring in the whole idea that he was interested in, in cybernetics and psychology, uh, you know, more or less the idea of the second law. 
But he comes up with this idea that um, it's because there's a lot more ways for things to be in a muddle than they are for them to be tidy. So I thought, number one, I said, now I'm getting it, because they were very sloppy kind of exchanges. But the muddle and tidiness thing, I thought, might interest Marika. That's number one. Or maybe it should interest all of us as a kind of a set of polarities with which to think about what it is that architects do. And all of the places in between full-on tidiness and full-on useless muddle, all the different places where one can find, shall we say, illumination, or shall we say, insight or penetration into what we don't know about reality. Okay, so I won't go on here. I, I'm really wasting a hell of a lot of time. But one thing that was important about my about what I discovered about what it meant to the dialogue, uh, the metalogue, is um, is the idea that a conversation to take place there has to be differences. Um, they are sort of the foundation of the metalogue and. Bateson, of course, was primarily in life interested only in differences. He famously described or defined information as the difference that makes a difference. But in any case, the, the problem between tidiness and muddle is also one of how differences are organized and how we adopt a certain posture toward them. So. Marika and I, as we started to, we tried to have a few beginnings of conversation on the telephone last week to see if we could come up with a kind of a thing that we would, that we would engage in collectively. Um, today we ask ourselves, how do our arguments, that's to say the, 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 the things that we share, our similarities, how do they differentiate? How do they become different? How do they diverge when we apply them to our different or diverging objects of concern and difference, which is to say that, you know, Marika, you know, I was with her for virtually the entire time in which she was doing her PhD uh, at Harvard um, as a, if not an Emmy Nels Grise at times, certainly as, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, a part director. Um, I know there was a commonality of commitment to a certain framework of ideas, but there's a difference in generation, which increasingly fascinates me, especially as I watch now, if I may say this, I watch Marika looking around in order to engage the theoretical, and shall we say the philosophical um, questions that architects need to ask and need to embody in their work and how to connect them to what is around one. So, we agreed that instead of speaking about our past and the conversation that we shared back then, that we would actually try to converse about how we seek to attach our thought to the present. So, Marika is interested in a number of ideas. I'm not going to say what those are, or a number, uh, she's interested in a certain kind of work. And in order to frame a conversation that we had that was going absolutely nowhere, I, I proposed that maybe, Marika, I said, maybe you are interested these days in coming up with a framework of understanding that comes up for an accounting for dissonance in the world, and I'm interested in remote consonance, which is to say the patterns that connect, well, I'm interested primarily in patterns, but the patterns which connect even where their connection is not apparent and needs to be built. So I'm going to pass this off to Marika now. So I would say, okay, so I actually like the idea. We talked about this. So we were like, okay, you can do dissonance and then I'll do remote consonants. But then I was like, but I kind of like remote con consonants better. Remember, I, so I refused to stay with dissonance. But then I thought there is one way that I'm still okay with dissonance. So, and that way is I am uh, uh, interested in and committed to and passionate about uh, architectural work that generates distant, uh, dissonance in, in relation to the status quo. Okay, so that is actually what I, what I look for. So that kind of dissonance I'm okay with. 
I'm also interested in architecture that never resolves um, the expressions or manifestations of dissonance that occur when that happens. So things, uh, objects, or design approaches, um, or uh, even, even uh, uh, things as, uh, as superficial as patterns, um, uh, or textures, uh, that fail to resolve in and of themselves because they cannot resolve relative to everything else around them. So yes, dissonance in that way. But I'm also committed to an architecture that has a more, um, uh, you know that word, who is it that used it? I can't remember now. Maybe Plato? Someone old. Uh, syntony, the notion of syntony. So syntony. S-Y-N-T-O-N-Y. Why don't you just tell us what that word means? Oh, yeah. So basically, it's this, okay, so it's this, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a kind of harmonious uh, set of relationships that is constantly and sort of fragilely established. But the way that it's usually used is in relationship between what we know to be possible and what we are able somehow to negatively imagine, maybe the, to use Deleuze's term, the virtual, um, and to kind of establish a kind of back and forth, kind of fragile, shifting harmony between those two things. So that's the kind of uh, remote consonance that I would be okay with, is a remote consonance between architecture that uh, 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 is dissonant relative to the world around it, but nevertheless is trying to establish a harmony with things that we might, uh, that we might not yet be able to imagine, right? Because that's, that's what architecture does. That's what makes architecture matter in the world. Well, uh, say it again, what does? Because that's what I was about to ask you. Uh, no, no, what makes it matter? No, just say it simply for everyone. What makes it matter what is makes that it's one, it's one of the ways in which we get to connect uh -huh. existing modes of imagination in the world and images of things, or imaginations of things, or even kind of vague uh, outlines of things that we can't yet comprehend, that we can't yet imagine. Okay, so I totally so agree with you on the one yeah. thing, but just, I'm, gonna I'm gonna challenge you. I'm gonna challenge you on one thing, and this is that you haven't named any names, and you haven't been specific, and you haven't given us any absolute descriptions yet. Neither have but you. But given your, given your sketch, your first sketch, about the status quo and the need in some ways to counter it with, uh, with dissonance, um, I would ask you to explain how your position today differs from the ideology that drove what we came to call deconstructivist architecture um, and, uh, you know, in, the, in the 90s. Uh, I would also, at the same time, want to ask you to acknowledge or to explain what you mean by status quo, because it seems to me what is different in those days is that there was a very firm, conventional, and orderly framework that deconstructivism at least could affect to be challenging and dismantling. Whereas today, when I look at the status quo, I don't know where to look, you have to direct my attention to it, if it's in architecture or if it's in our world around us, it seems full of noise, conflict, hostility, et cetera, et cetera. It seems to me one would not be immediately impelled uh, to add to it, or one would actually lose one's signal, if you like, against the background of that noise, that one might actually seek different, shall we say, features like harmony or um, euphony or whatever uh, follows from that. Uh, yeah, it's Tidiness. a hard word. It's a hard word to go back to. Okay, uh, no one wants to go back precisely to order. But you know, let me just say another thing is that what is the context for architecture? Uh, you have to say what it is, what you meant by status quo. The other thing that strikes me is that we are looking at very different conditions of what provides the background for uh, how we think of making, forming, and organizing today, which is precisely the crisis of nature. And now I know this was a topic that you addressed a lot in your PhD in, uh, in, in, you know, through the 17th, 18th, whatever, 18th and 19th century. Nature is perhaps today's dominant problem 
How does architecture of dissonance help us develop, shall we say, a connection to nature or a connection to the problem of nature that, um, well, let's just say that is either illuminating, healing even, to use that kind of a term, or uh, restorative or simply productive and, um, and uh, producing, shall we say, hope or joy or whatever else it may be. Like, how can dissonance be used today to fight dissonance? Well, I don't know that dissonance is really the problem that the world faces today, so I guess I would say that uh, first. So you say we have a, a surplus of euphony? <laughs> no, I, I, so, no, a euphony would be great. It would be awesome mm. to have a surplus of euphony. Um, uh, I think what we have instead is a surplus of a, 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 fe a feeling, like an imagination, a cultural imagination that's trapped um, in a mode of uh, a disengagement and helplessness. And actually, that's where I think dissonance is useful. So dissonance as some kind of conflict or some kind of struggle or some uh, 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 registration of the fact um, that nature itself is far from harmonious, but instead contains uh, 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 moments of irresolution uh, that can be uh, 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 capitalized upon or, or expanded upon to produce new possibilities in the world, and that those things don't happen when everything is ordered and organized, um, but they instead happen when systems are, <laughs> right? I'm, like, I'm using your own language here. Uh, uh, when systems are very close to the edge of chaos, or when they're far from mm -hmm. equilibrium, uh, uh, that those are that actually those are the moments that not only already exist as opportunities for us in the world, but that we, as part of the production of nature, can also invent. So we can actually make those spaces, and that's and the reason. And by the way. That's different from, I, it would be horrible to go back to deconstructivism. So I don't, I don't I'm with wanna, you there. It was horrible wanna, the first time. Yeah, uh, yeah, it was bad. It was bad. Um, so I don't want to do that, and I don't want to be associated with that project. So now oh, I'm, I'm not to, associating. I'm really I'm, just I'm trying to dis, provoke. I'm disassociating um, myself here. But, but I'll tell you how I'm disassociating myself. It's exactly in the, in the way that you said. So if, if the project of deconstructivism was based on the idea that there was a a uh, dominant system that could then be deconstructed, that could then be taken apart, and that somehow that work of taking apart was itself sufficient to challenge the system. Nowadays, because of all the fuzz and all the noise and uh, uh, the, the, the obvious multiplicity uh, that we recognize existing in, in what surrounds us today, so maybe the status quo is not such a great term, but let's say our environments, uh, plural, uh, 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 it, it seems ridiculous to assume that any fixed structure that could be dismantled would ever, uh, would ever be a worthy opponent for the architectural imagination. I think the architectural imagination is much better uh, engaged in those glitchy moments um, in that mess uh, than it is in systematically taking apart uh, uh, something uh, that, uh, that the, uh, of which the taking apart uh, 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 would be such a stable process that it could be registered as such, right? So, that, so it's, I think it's completely different. Okay, so it's a wonderful and attachable concept, shall we say, the problem, or we could even say the ontology or the epistemology of the glitch, if I drop that word into the historical ether here, um, since I know that everything at SciArc immediately gets integrated, circulated, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, what is the glitch? Well, how can we think about the glitch? The glitch in some way attaches to certain aspects of a reality that we still need to properly describe and connects them in ways that, are, that can be put at the service of human being, let's say, and of human existence. Now, I would say let's figure out how that can be done and let's figure out how that would work if it's true. Now, I'm gonna, I see David Rue turned up and uh, 
I can never, I can never not um, What is the word here? I have to address the presence of, uh, 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 of uh, uh, I want to talk about a generational problem here. And I mean, because it's, it's it, what we, we all think of. We all tend to think these days generationally. I know that to be the case for Marika as well. Um, and it is increasingly uh, painfully the case with me. I, I made a couple of notes this morning, and I'm going to see if I can put it together here in a co coherent way because it's a maybe a contentious version of history or an account of what happened in the last 20 years, um, which may offer openings uh, for practitioners of all ages and of all generations. I uh, point out here, I said, especially because we were going to talk about ontology, which is a little bit the theme of the course uh, that we're teaching together. And I write here that ontological interest in, and I use the term here, template activities and properties. And what I mean by that template, a template simply is the idea that there would be a kind of a schema that can generate, uh, that can generate um, um, material, substance, shall we say, form, um, which was the dominant mode of theorization, shall we say, and understanding in architecture for at least a couple of decades, um, maybe four decades. But interest in these template activities and template properties gradually seeded at the end of the 1990s as software interfaces uh, abstracted experience and stunted user intuition by substituting its own arbitrary mechanisms of generation for those formally experienced as connected and continuous within the physical world or within nature itself. Um, and even though the first generations of generative uh, architecture, that's to say the template type uh, architecture, let's say that goes back to the formalisms right out of Colin Rowe and the manipulations, and in many cases also the glitch ontologies of Peter Eisenman and other, um, and the next generations of those types of formalists. And at the same time I say, and within the very same movement, concern with and capacity to sense the connective pattern across the manifold of experience was dimmed to the point of becoming almost fully disconnected. It seemed to me that my generation was, for historical re for, by historical happenstance, if for no other reason, actually was in the position to define the territories of production, and that's to say that architecture tended to draw cues from the systems of, well, from the systems of thought, let's say, that were being generated within the, within the field, essentially by, by theorists, whereas the age today it seems that theorists are seeking to take their cues from production as if they were looking at what is around and trying to come up with a theory for it. Well, How do you feel about I, that? I don't, I don't know. I would, dis I, would, I would dispute that a bit. Um, I, if, I, if I'm at all representative of my generation, that is, which I, I probably am. I actually. would say, if I may say this, this is... I don't mean this in no demeaning way. You're a perfect abstract example of an emerging theorist. And we can look at you as a case study. <laughs> is this the meta log part? It is. It is. It is. All right. So what I would say, I understand what you're saying. So guys, what he's saying is, what he's saying is that in his day, people started with the philosophy and found things in architecture that might Yeah, they tried to make the architecture match or, or, or uh, let's just say it was meant it. to transmit intuition from thought into physical experience. And today we wonder whether or not the opposite framework is in play and we are looking at physical experience and somehow trying to express it in thought, systematic thought 
if it is in fact possible. So, so I guess my, my, I'm a little uneasy about that um, because although I understand what you're saying, so you're saying we're, we're basically starting with, with uh, the work that's out there, the work that's avail available to us and trying to find a way to make it meaningful. Um, uh, uh, I guess what I would say is I, I think the role of theory is to neither try to illustrate I, uh, you know, rich or valid uh, philosophical or ontological ideas with architectural examples. I don't find that particularly productive. Um, nor to simply try to create alibis um, or meanings for things that are already in the world. I think the role of theory is to seize on those little, those little moments, like the, the, and they can be super tiny. They can be just bits of projects. They can be um, sort of hesitant steps in one direction. They can be um, a moment here, a moment there, a design decision here, an aesthetic effect there, across the spectrum, to seize on those things that represent what I would say is the fundamental potential of architecture, and that is to radically insert difference in the world. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. So now I get to interpret you. Um, I don't remember which particular group of mystical Christians it was, but they, they believed in angels. And it seems to me like what you're telling me is a story again I hear about angels. You remember they used to say things like, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Um, but the eerie idea that angels, that if you could get a bunch of angels to dance on the head of the pin, they'd be pretty damn small angels. And you're suggesting, in fact, that being, I don't want to sound like a Heideggerian here, but since we're playing with this idea of ontology, that being, in fact, can reveal itself at the very, very smallest scale, that you could find, in fact, an architecture that was a micro-architecture. That's to say, a moment would, would have been your term, um, at which, that's to say, or a difference that could make a difference, and it could be found at the microscopic scale, and then it would be potentially, I suppose, scalable, but it would have to find its way, I assume, into expression and thought, let's say, in language, etc. Um, is that what you would say? Is yeah, that what you I, say, that the search today is now with a microscope and no longer, shall we say, with a computer as it was in the 80s and 90s in science, or before that, let's say, you know, the long view, um, the telescopic? If we're thinking about the infinite versus the infinitesimal, uh, or the large and continuous versus uh, the discrete, uh, then I would say, yeah, I see more potential at the moment in the small and particular than I do in the large and the smooth and the general. But what I meant, actually, by finding these moments is not necessarily restricted to scale. Like, there are projects, and I'm kind of deliberately staying away from You could say something. You could say it. It's time. How many we got? Yeah, it's all right now. You can, you can start letting people know the kind of things that attract your interest. I see no downside to that. Well, of course, you can also decline. I don't, I, I don't know. I kind of feel like I'm reticent about this right now. All right, stay out of trouble. Just all right, yeah, stay out of trouble. Uh, but, uh, but, but there are projects where overall project seems pretty bound to existing conventions. And so then I'm like, eh. But then there's like some little problem with it. There's some little irresolution with it um, that doesn't seem to belong to the existing system of architectural thought or imagistic thought or uh, the known, right? And so it doesn't necessarily have to be something that's actually small. It could be something that's diffused across the entire project but something that's not jiving, something that is, to use a, a phrase uh, from Simon Don, so the class that we've been teaching on ontology, we've been basing uh, on the thought of Gilbert uh, Simon Don uh, and his notion of individuation, uh, uh, where he defines a process of individuation um, as a process in which things fall out of phase with themselves or they fall out of step with themselves. And I find that to be really exciting. So how? How do things, assuming that we can agree for a minute, 
that um, architects are interested in the production of things, um, and it's, it's a, a focus on objects, a focus on things. Um, how can things, uh, how can we uh, 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 add a bit of agency to those things? How can we motivate them to keep acting on our behalves um, and to also then have them turn around and motivate us, right? So how can we inject imagination into them in such a way that they also inject imagination back into what we believe is possible and actable? Well, I think one of those ways is to create these moments of lags, um, or these lags, lags like a, like a something that's not mm, a, delays, a, a, yep. a, a dissonance, something falling out something of step, falling out of step, something even it could be even as as kind of soft as syncopation, let's say, but just things that are not aligning precisely, um, and that suggest the possibility of other systems or other organizations that have yet to be uh, uh, brought into the existing system of things. I didn't follow the whole thing there, but the, it's also because I was in, no, because I became too interested in certain parts of it as you were uh, moving along. Uh, the first thing, the, the, the downer in me, uh, first has to clear a few of the things off the table, and I wonder to a degree, to the degree in which I recognize resonances in what you say with other things I hear increasingly these days, I wonder to what degree some of this is not a reflection of a growing sense of general impotence that people feel with respect to their capacity to transform uh, their, um, their realities or, or to invent them. The other thing that strikes me is that in the best ontologies, um, uh, the thing that you, what you refer to as things um, are understood to actually require one another for their intelligibility. And this and, and general... The ultimate, and the ultimate example there would be some kind of really, right, that, 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 a, that, a, that a, uh, a really productive ontology would be about figuring out a way in which the matter in the mind can be connected in imaginative ways to the matter of everything else. Yeah, I, was, I had that point here made, saving that one for the end. Oh, sorry. Somebody should let us know when we're getting close to the end. Um, uh, but I suppose the, the idea I wanted to introduce there was that uh, there can really be no ontology without ecology. And that any ontology that doesn't put ecology first uh, is no real ontology at all. Now, I, that in a way, of course, just shut down the conversation, I can see from your point of view, from your, from your expression. But in fact, I would argue that that is more or less where your left hand is going, even when your right hand is looking for microscopic glitches. And I mean this generally speaking in your work. Um, well, yeah. So I mean, I, I guess I'm not. I'm not. Again, I'm not arguing um, for the microscopic and discrete, as if those entities could be underst understood outside of a relational system. I'm actually interested in them as potential moments for relationships that actually haven't been developed, connected to systems that actually haven't been imagined. And I do think you're right. I think actually one of the main things, you said the main thing confronting us today, or one of the main things is a kind of crisis of nature. Uh, and I guess I think of it a little bit differently and maybe sort of in a, in a more um, anthropocentric and problematic way. I think it's a crisis of imagination. And I think it's a crisis uh, of, of, of people uh, feeling um, as if they cannot change uh, the world around them, as if they cannot invent other possibilities for themselves, as if they cannot uh, actually imagine other futures than the one the present is telling them is coming. I actually think that is the, I think it's a problem of imagination. And that's why I think it's a super exciting time to be in architecture, actually, because Architecture is one of those disciplines in the world that deals with uh, imagination in a speculative um, and inexhaustible way, in my opinion. And, and it has to do, actually, with connecting existing imaginations, like the kind of imagination that you would get from like the best client ever, right? Or the kind of imagination that's put on the table uh, by your studio instructors, who, by the way, are the best client you'll ever have, uh, 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 to uh, things that 
no one can yet imagine. I gave my uh, whatever, that sort of maybe half dismissive, maybe half apocalyptic interpretation of what happened in the last 20 years as the generations had to encounter a world full of equipment, machines, software, and the type of crypto and sort of quasi-subjectivities that those introduced to say that the quality and the tonality of experience had radically changed in architectural culture. And when you talk about imagination, I would say that imagination cannot be con conceived or constructed outside of that broader, if you say, you could say neuroecology or that of, of, of how can, of what one can expect from experience and what kind of intelligibility one can expect, if you like, from, the, you know, from, from, from an architectural practice. It isn't to say that architects don't still con you know, generate physical things and, uh, and have these feedback loops that tell them how these physical things alter and transform um, uh, the environment and you know, change, if you like, the, the continual feedback loops but rather what the scope is of, of, of architectural imagination today. That's to say, I feel that it has become cut off, if you like, from the broader, even if it was inarticulate or not fully articulated in past times, there was a general positioning of where the architectural imagination placed itself in terms of what it was going to connect its inventions to in the way of creating a whole cosmology. Whatever happened, uh, yeah, here, uh, um, uh, Kolha said, whatever happened to urbanism, I would say, whatever happened to cosmology? And you could say you could build up a cosmology from the glitch, but uh, you still have to say, I want to do that. So, yes, it is cosmological imagination, I suppose, that I feel. Um, has been interfered with, with the rise of, um, well, with the rise, let's just say, from the abstracting um, and separative function, let's say, of computational environments. It is, it's a, you know, it's a little, so, I'll leave it at that and hand it back. Because it seems to me also that some of the things you find most uh, potentially rich, shall we say, or, 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 or disruptive, and I mean that in a good sense, at least, and some people call that good, I don't particularly, but anyway, in terms of the glitch, that these are glitches that are actually artifacts from these artificial environments, i.e., they are artifacts what, that appear on a screen. Yes, or that and appear... That are being transferred into yeah, the material or world. Or that appear in various processes of making form, um, or making um, say models, or making other yeah, but other not in the sandbox, right? Rather in the in the software uh, environment. Yeah. Yeah, like my yeah, like that Xerox I had in class yesterday that didn't print properly, and it just it had a meh. so yeah. This is these are artifacts. They used to we use the word artifacts. Um, probably only for ten or fifteen years, and most people in the room are probably too young to remember. They were things that computers produced just glitches really just garbage little moments of garbage that just came from nowhere they were produced by the interactions or the imperfect interactions if you like of um, of uh, embedded languages mm -hmm. now it strikes me that you are identifying the transfer or the transposition of those types of shall we say artificial um, um, let's just say errors, and in a way presenting them in the f at the scale of physical experience as things that we can, shall we say, learn from, or things that which can carry us to new extended insights yeah, about here, our destiny. Yeah, and here is where I think the micro is, is, is useful, actually, because if you're talking about the scale of a pixel or a voxel, let's say you're talking about something pretty small. Um, or if you're talking about something that, uh, that occurs because uh, you've got uh, an image or a design process that's low resolution, for example. So those are usually small things, then you scale them up and you're like, Whoa. 
Um, that's a mess. Um, so, so yeah, maybe there is something um, that's uh, that's inherently micro, or that's in, uh, that's inherently uh, a small scale uh, that maybe we can that, that maybe we can assign a particular value at this moment in time. But the reason I think those glitches are productive is precisely because architecture deals with such um, uh, a collision of different systems, different systems of time, different systems of duration, different systems of under understanding uh, the, the, the physical worlds, you know, and then we can get like really technical, so different, you know, H systems that are as, as, as basic as HVAC systems versus uh, structural systems uh, versus uh, this, uh, systems that are uh, given in uh, um, uh, uh, various components or panel uh, systems. You know, it doesn't have to be, uh, I, I mean, I'm talking about actual physical systems for the most part, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Weather systems, big to small. Um, uh, uh, that, that, there, that it is a really good place, it seems to me. It's a really good moment for these glitches to appear and then to be capitalized on. Right, not as moments of garbage, actually, but just as these kind of eruptions of difference. And I am, I am committed to difference. I am completely unsatisfied. All difference, with, or no? But I'm, com I'm committed to the possibility of difference, even when it's ugly and it doesn't matter, and it ends up being a, 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 a detriment to a, a project um, or a mistake, or you know. Any of the, even, even then, I still appreciate the fact that it was in the world even for a little bit. Um, because it strikes me that one of the consequences of this kind of collective uh, 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 failure uh, to be able to imagine that we are capable of uh, behaving differently than, or making, uh, uh, than how we're behaving now, or uh, making a difference uh, in the world, all of those things, a kind of collective failure of a kind of a gentle imagination uh, come from um, a kind of leveling fog of sameness that seems to have uh, blanketed our imaginations with too much of almost exactly the same thing. Okay. So just for the audience, because we didn't get there yet, um, where does the concept of remote consonance come from? It comes from Arnold Schoenberg's um, theory of harmony. Um, because, you know, for those of you who know about the atonal movement, uh, many of the compositions, all the compositions probably for decades sounded like shit. Um, they sounded like noise, they were disruptive, they were, uh, they grated. Uh, it was very, very difficult to intuit the, the integrated unity, shall we say, and the relationships of pattern, of tonal pattern, that unified the musical, the, the musical events. And Schoenberg, in his later life, uh, here in Los Angeles, actually, he wrote this incredible book called The Theory of Harmony. He basically revealed to all of us that it wasn't dissonance that he was looking for, that he actually, pl he actually worked everything out mathematically such that he believed that we stretch, if you like, the relationships, the mathematical relationships of tone, um, and that the, the ear and the brain, so to speak, would eventually be able to associate them and hear them as, um, as integrated, unified, and even it, it integrated music that would actually move us, if you like, uh, move our inner music uh, uh, as well. But I well. think that's, and that's directly applicable. To, uh, sorry, I don't mean to rush you out of your thought, but I'm conscious mm. that we actually have to start questions like, oh, in a oh, minute. Oh. And so then, of course, I wanted to get the last word in. Get the word, get the uh, word here. No, that's but guys, that's the, <laughs> that's the, that's the, that's one of the, the most applicable, directly applicable concepts that I can think of into architecture. And I'm really glad that you brought it up. Um, it's because what are we trying to train people to do in places like SciArc except to design architecture for the future, for future ears, let's say, for future brains, um, but not just any futures, not just the kind of dystopian futures or um, extinct uh, futures, right, but for futures that we actually collectively decide that we value and want to aim for. Good last word. Yeah. <laughs> 